Well, hello, everybody. I want to uh, warmly welcome you uh, to what has unexpectedly been the delayed launch of our first ever Texas Science Festival. Uh, the severe weather and utility challenges here in Texas over recent days have had an impact not just on our schedule, but on many, many individuals and families throughout our state. So first, allow me to say that I hope wherever you are, you and your loved ones are well and safe. My name is Paul Goldbart, and I'm the Dean of the College of Natural Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. And we are so very pleased to open the virtual doors of our university and our scientific labs through this series. I'm not sure there has ever been a more apt moment than right now for providing meaningful connections between scientists and non-scientists. Whether the focus is on conquering the COVID-19 public health emergency or on ensuring preparations for extreme weather events, science and scientists play a central role in partnership with the public we serve. The festival's theme, Science for a Changing World, speaks to the real world impact we as scientists aim to have in our work. As thrilled as we are at the beauty of discovery and understanding fundamentals about the natural world, we also rise when the call of duty arrives, as it did in this last year for both of our speakers joining us today. Associate Professor of Molecular Biosciences, Jason McClellan, made key discoveries about the shape and operation of the coronavirus spike protein, the virus's chief weapon, and his work is fundamental to vaccine development and antibody treatments, featuring prominently in the vaccines from Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and others. And Professor of Integrative Biology and Statistics, Lauren Ansel Myers, has advised states, cities, school districts, and even the White House, explaining in great detail how the virus spreads and what various mitigation strategies would achieve. These two scientists have been featured repeatedly in national and state media for their groundbreaking work, and I am delighted they're here to share ideas and answer questions with all of you. Because this is one of our Science Sparks events, each speaker will have about 10 minutes for presentation and a few minutes for Q&A. You will be able to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as we can in the time allowed. First up, Dr. Jason McClellan is an Associate Professor of Molecular Biosciences and the new Robert A. Welsh Chair in Chemistry, and the winner of multiple research awards, including the 2020 Golden Goose Award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, in recognition of work of great societal benefit. Jason, over to you. Okay. Thanks so much, Paul, for the introduction. And thank you to all of you tuning in. So let me share my screen. Oh, uh, can somebody uh, enable participant screen sharing? I'll tell you a little about our work on coronaviruses and spike protein and vaccines. So my talk, is development of COVID-19 vaccines. So I'll start off with a little bit about how our immune system works. It can be trained to recognize pathogens. And so upon natural infection with, let's say a virus, a coronavirus, um, if we survive, we generate immune cells, B cells, plasma blasts. These can produce antibodies that can bind to the virus and viral proteins as well as a variety of different T cells. And these can help protect us upon encountering the virus again. For a vaccination, we're trying to do something very similar, but rather than get infected, we want to train the immune system to recognize some or all parts of a virus and generate the very same types of cells, B cells, plasma blasts, antibodies, T cells. So that way, when we encounter this virus again, we already have these molecules that are primed to recognize it and get rid of it. So to make a vaccine, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made, right? We're trying to train our immune system to recognize this virus. And so what do we use as our vaccine? Uh, we could grow up a lot of the virus and then inactivate it with some sort of chemical or heat. And that can work sometimes, but it also causes sometimes damage to the virus and the proteins and they change shapes, fall apart. 
And, and that can be suboptimal. Um, we could make a weakened version of the virus, but this can take a long time and you have to make sure it's sufficiently weak, uh, but not too weak. Alternatively, we could focus on using one or more of the viral proteins, let's say this surface protein called spike. Um, and then if we want to use spike, there's a lot of different decisions to make. Do we use the whole portion of the spike, one subunit, a fragment of it? And if we decide to use one or more of the proteins, do we want to grow up large quantities of the protein and purify it and then directly inject the protein into a person? Or do we want to inject um, nucleic acid, genetic information like DNA, RNA, or a viral vector that encodes for the protein? So that way our own body cells make the viral protein that trains our immune system to recognize the pathogen. So a lot of different decisions that need to go into it. And what my lab focuses on are these, um, the, the subunit type vaccines, so the, the protein-based vaccines. And we need to figure out what's the optimal antigen to use either as a purified protein or to encode in any of these different genetic viral vector vaccines. So the surface of coronaviruses is decorated with spike proteins. And this was seen very early on. We saw there's this fringe of these large protrusions. And we've known about coronaviruses since the 1960s. So this is a nature paper from 1968 where the group of scientists proposed the name coronavirus. That they saw these particles are more or less rounded in profile. There's some polymorphism, so they're not perfect circles or spheres. And they have this characteristic fringe of projections that are rounded or petal shaped. And it, the appearance recalls the solar corona. And so they put forth the name coronaviruses for this family. And again, our role is to try and figure out how to make the best possible vaccine. And decades of research since the 1960s showed that the spike protein, right? So one of them shown here, is a very good vaccine antigen. When people are infected, they make a lot of antibodies against the spike, but we really didn't know what it looked like, right? So this is just kind of a amorphous blob. Uh, even, even five years ago, spike was still shown in scientific publications as something like this, but this is insufficient information to make a, a really good vaccine antigen that we can engineer and design appropriately. And so what we turn to is structural biology. And that's a field of study that allows us to obtain uh, atomic or molecular level information on these proteins. And so we were part of the, the first uh, group, the collaboration with Andrew Ward and Barney Graham to determine the three-dimensional structure of a coronavirus spike protein. And this was back in 2016 for the coronavirus called HK1. And these structures just provide a wealth of information about where the receptor binding domains are located, how the three different subunits of the protein come together. And this is very helpful for vaccine design. We're able to do this due to advances in uh, a lot of different uh, disciplines, but one in particular for coronaviruses, is called electron microscopy or cryo-electron microscopy. And that involves these really high powered electron microscopes that we're very fortunate to have here at UT Austin. And so with some of our structural work and uh, structural work from many others in the field on SARS-CoV-2, we now are able to put together a, uh, an animation based on all of this knowledge about how the spike protein functions during entry. And so we know the surface of the coronavirus has about 25 or 30 individual spike proteins they have some dynamics to them. They're, they're not static. Parts of them are moving up and down. So as a coronavirus comes near a host cell, we have these receptor binding domains that are flexing up and down. They're getting bound by host cell receptors. Right? So these are molecules on the surface of our own cells to which the spike attaches and attaches the virus. Then some of our other proteins on the surface of our cells come along and modify and make small cuts in the spike protein. That causes some of the spike to fall off, leaving a portion of it behind. This exists in what we call a prefusion conformation. Then it undergoes this really dramatic refolding event where a part of it shoots into our host cell membrane, forming a pre-hairpin intermediate. And then this collapses back down into yet another conformation 
that brings the viral membrane and the host cell membrane together. So now it's in the post-fusion conformation. And there's a fusion pore that allows the contents of the virus to enter into our cells. So with all that knowledge about spike proteins, when designing a vaccine, we have questions that we need to answer. Are we using the full spike? Do we want to use uh, the native spike sequence is encoded by the virus. Do we want to try and make something that's stabilized in the pre-fusion form? That's what's on the surface of the virus. Or do we want to use post-fusion? And from our work and many others, we've learned that the pre-fusion form of the spikes, which is the form that decorates the, the infectious virus, is really the optimal vaccine antigen. And what my group is able to do, using structural information, some protein engineering, making two changes in the protein sequence in this region, we're able to help lock the protein in this form and prevent it from falling apart and from triggering into the post-fusion form. And we actually did a lot of this work back in 2016 and 2017, working on other coronaviruses. So we were starting to work on the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus or MERS. And what we saw is that if we just purified spike, what we call wild type spike, the same sequence encoded by the virus, um, we get this mixture of some pre-fusion spikes, some post-fusion spikes, and this is heterogeneous and it's really not optimal for trying to make the best vaccine. And what we showed is that with our uh, small change, we changed two residues to proline, so we call it 2P, we can now make this homogeneous population of pre-fusion spikes. And what was great is that it not only worked for MERS, but it also worked for the first SARS coronavirus, the one that emerged back in 2002. And the wild type, spike encoded by the virus can change conformations and be this mixture. Whereas with our two amino acid changes, we get all pre-fusion spikes. And we show that this is a better vaccine antigen. So we had all of this knowledge back in 2017. So at the beginning of last year, when the new virus, SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19 emerged, Chinese scientists were able to sequence the entire genome and publish it online January 10th. And 20 days after that, my group had already added in our amino acid changes to the spike protein, produced it in the lab, and then were able to determine a three-dimensional structure of the pre-fusion stabilized spike protein. This stabilized spike protein, which we call 2P, is now in four of the leading COVID-19 vaccines. So the ones from Moderna uses these two changes at positions 986 and 987 as well as Pfizer and BioNTech have the two changes up there. Those are the mRNA vaccines. Novavax, which is a purified spike protein, also contains the 2P mutations at 986 and 987, as does the Johnson & Johnson adenoviral-based vaccine it uses the two proline mutations. And so hopefully what I've been able to uh, describe is how there's been a lot of effort in prior research that's enabled the vaccine development to go quickly. So for traditional development, there's a design and exploratory phase where we're trying to figure out what's the best antigen, the best protein molecule to use, very iterative process, doing long mouse immunizations. Then there's some preclinical work in mice, non-human primates. Uh, you have to do a phase one, which takes one to two years, make decisions based on those data, whether to proceed and scale up for phase two, which can take another two years, then more decisions and manufacturing time to scale up for a, a 30,000 person phase three, which lasts two to three years, a review process, and then finally the go ahead to begin making millions and millions of doses. And so that whole process can take 10, 15 years or longer. And so for SARS-CoV vaccine, development, uh, we really already knew how to make optimal spike proteins that save a lot of time here. And there was a lot of really good development on the different platforms, like the mRNA vaccine development. Uh, the mRNA vaccine platform is really mature and had been tested for a lot of other viruses. And then the clinical trials were somewhat overlapping. And the companies, because of some of the money given by Operation Warp Speed, could begin production now, during, during this entire time, they were producing and scaling up at risk, and we were able to shorten the entire time to around 10 months. So that's a little bit of how the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 vaccines were created and how many of them used some of the information and technology we developed years ago. I want to thank everybody in my lab, and my collaborators, Andrew Ward, Barney Graham, members of their lab, funding, and I'd be happy to take any questions. 
Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Jason, and thank you for the beautiful work that you and your collaborators uh, have uh, done. Uh, let me uh, ask you uh, to take some questions and I, I will uh, read them out to you and uh, uh, ask you to answer them, address them. So here's the first one uh, from Fawn Rose and uh, Fawn Rose asks, are the vaccines effective against all the different strains? Good question. So they it, it can't group all the vaccines uh, together. In general, the vaccines are working a little less well against some of the variants compared to others. Uh, for the mRNA vaccines, they're starting off at 95% efficacy, which is quite high. And then against the viral variants, uh, particularly the South, the South African variant, they drop maybe by 25% or so. Um, and, and that's okay, even 60% efficacy is still really good. And we think they continue to prevent the very severe disease, hospitalizations and deaths. And companies are uh, working on boosters and new formulations that encode the viral variants. Good, thank you very much. Uh, here's the next one, and this is from Lynn. And Lynn asks, since this is the first mRNA vaccine, how can we be sure it's safe? Yeah. and does not have any long-term effects. Yeah, so it's the first one that's uh, been approved, but it's not the first one that's ever been tested. It's not the first time mRNA vaccines have gone into people. Moderna and BioNTech have actually tested 10, 20 different uh, vaccines, mRNA vaccines in people in phase one and phase two the last 10 years or so, and there's been no long-term adverse events. So we feel that the mRNA vaccines are very safe based on all the years of data on mRNA vaccines in general. Thank you. Uh, next up, Lohit. Lohit asks, does that mean we can design vaccines against any disease in the world? We can design them. They might not work as well. Uh, some viruses are notoriously difficult to design or create vaccines for. The structure-based approach is a very powerful tool that has helped us in many ways. But there are still some viruses like HIV, for instance, that are extremely difficult just because of all the different uh, strains and isolates. And it's kind of like how we now have a couple of different variants for SARS-CoV-2. For HIV, there's maybe hundreds or thousands, and it's hard to make one vaccine that can protect against all of them. But many are using structural biology to try and rationally design optimal vaccines, and they're, they're making some progress. Thank you. Next up, Kevin. Kevin asks, is it possible to intercept new viruses before they turn into a pandemic situation? Yeah, there's different ways of, of doing that. Um, so potentially with, with improved testing and quarantining, it, it could be possible early on uh, to identify those who are sick, quarantine them, and kind of snuff out the, the virus, prevent spreading. It depends on the, the virus. It's easier for a virus that only transmits when a person is showing symptoms. SARS-CoV-2 was really tricky because there's a lot of asymptomatic cases. People didn't even know they were infected and were already spreading it. And so it, was, it had kind of escaped beyond what could be quarantined. Uh, we and others are working on medical countermeasures against emerging pathogens. Uh, for instance, we're working on a universal or pan-coronavirus vaccines that could work against all the known coronaviruses, as well as ones that, are, that we know are in bats that haven't emerged yet. Uh, and so that's kind of a proactive method to, to try and intervene very early. Thank you. Uh, next up, Sarah. Sarah asks, what unique resources were you able to utilize at UT that helped you and your team in this work? Yeah, probably one of the, the major ones were the, uh, the brand new electron microscopes that's in our sour structural biology facility. Uh, these are multi-million dollar, extremely uh, high-end state-of-the-art microscopes. And it allows us to make very small amounts of these viral proteins, look at them directly, uh, generate these three-dimensional structures and provide a lot of information on how the spike works, how antibodies bind, uh, we also work with uh, Eli Lilly to help them down select from hundreds of antibodies to their final antibody, COVID-555 or bamlanivimab, 
And again, we use the, the electron microscopes to do that. Thank you. Um, next up, Marilyn. Marilyn asks, do scientists ever work on the early stages of development for a potential vaccine for different virus types before a serious outbreak happens? Yes, uh, scientists do a lot of that. And it can sometimes consider it a very basic science research, just understanding a new organism, trying to identify what proteins are, are protective. Um, we're working on viruses now and, and other pathogens, bacteria, parasites that maybe people haven't heard of because we don't know what's going to emerge. Um, so one of the ones we're working on is Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus, which probably not many people have heard about, but it causes a really lethal uh, viral uh, hemorrhagic fever and it's starting to spread, it's tick-borne. Um, but yeah, we and, and many scientists around the world are interested in pathogens broadly. And the time to do that type of basic science research is before something becomes a full-blown pandemic. Thank you. Next up, Beth. Beth asks, can you talk about how effective the COVID vaccines are compared to other vaccines for different diseases? Oh, uh, that is a tough, there are so many different vaccines, each with their own efficacies. 95% uh, efficacy, which is what we're getting for the, the two mRNA vaccines is extremely high and is among the, the, the very best vaccines. Um, there's still a lot we don't know in terms of uh, duration of immunity, when we need boosters and other things, so it can be a little hard to compare. We don't expect it to be a lifelong immunity, like for instance, measles vaccines, just because of the nature of SARS-CoV-2. The fact that it's a respiratory pathogen that goes into the nose and mouth, that's, that's generally very hard to protect against long-term. Um, but the, the vaccines for COVID-19 are actually su surprisingly good. Thank you. Next up, Thompson. Thompson asks, imagine that a brand new virus were to emerge for which no prior work exists. What would be a realistic maximum vaccine development period look like, or maybe minimum vaccine development period look like? That's a tough one. It, depends, it just depends com completely on, on the virus itself uh, and, and how much we, we know about it. Um, if, it if it was HIV-like, you know, we still don't have a vaccine for HIV despite billions of dollars of funding and decades of research. Whereas if it's close to something we know, like a coronavirus, a flu, uh, we can do it pretty quickly. Now, fortunately, there are many scientists who are out there surveying viruses in animal reservoirs, just sequencing the viruses in bats and pangolins and, and, and just trying to help us understand. So we can start researching them before they've ever even infected a, a human. Thank you. So we'll take one from Christine and, and, uh, and, and then we'll, uh, I'm afraid, have to move on, although there are, there are lots more questions that people want to ask. Uh, Christine asks, some treatment options sound pretty interesting. Do you do any work with nanobodies from llamas that may be useful for treatment? Yes, we actually uh, have done some work with the uh, camelid nanobodies. These are special antibodies that camelids like llamas and alpacas and dromedary camels can make. And uh, we've been successful in isolating one that can actually bind to the surface of SARS-CoV-2 and pre prevent infection. And that's being uh, clinically developed by our collaborators in Belgium. And they hope to start a phase one clinical trial in the next month or so. Thank you. So the last question uh, is from me. And I'm curious to know why we need two shots and why we can't just make do with one. Well, uh, we potentially could. It's just a, a lower efficacy, right? So one, they're, they're still trying to figure out exactly what sort of efficacy is provided by a single shot, but it's at maybe 70%, 75% uh, versus the 95% plus that, that we're getting with the, the two. Um, and so it's really just a, a decision that has to be made. Are we okay with 75% versus 95%? Again, it's 75% versus the original isolate but it would be maybe 25 or 30% lower against the new viral variant. And so starting high 95% and losing 25% efficacy down to 70% is, is probably okay. Starting at 70% and losing 25 is maybe not as good. Uh, these are really important decisions uh, that fortunately I don't have to make. Well, thanks very much indeed, Jason. And thanks again for your, for your beautiful work. Uh, we're going to move on now. Uh, today's next speaker is Lauren, Lauren Ansel Myers, Professor of Integrative Biology. And uh, Lauren is the holder of the Denton A. Cooley Centennial Professorship in Zoology. 
She's the director of the University of Texas at Austin COVID-19 Modeling Consortium, which brings together scientists, social scientists, health professionals, and engineers in developing innovative models that advance surveillance and forecasting about the virus and combat its spread effectively in communities, schools, and nationwide. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Dean Goldbart. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Oops, I think I was muted. Thank you, and uh, really excited to see all the science enthusiasts in the audience. Uh, let me share my screen, and we'll get started. Okay, great. So, in many ways, I have been planning for the COVID nineteen pandemic for my entire career. I'm a pandemic modeler for over 20 years. I've been using math, statistics, engineering, computing to try to understand how viruses spread, how pathogens spread, and what we can do to stop them and save lives. What you see on your screen now is a video of a model that we built for the state of Texas back in 2010 to help them to plan for the next pandemic. It allows somebody to run different simulations of fast spreading, slow spreading pathogens of deadly or less deadly pathogens, and then try different intervention strategies, try rolling out vaccines to one group versus another group, uh, deploying antiviral drugs, using school closures, and see how it all plays out. What you see now is another version of the exact same model being run at the University of Texas's visualization lab. We built a version of that so we could bring groups of policymakers and public health officials in to run exercises to help them to plan for and think about future threats like COVID. Fast forward to last year, 2000, actually two years ago now, 2019, and we, we ju had just started a project to ramp up the tools that we had built for the state of Texas to the entire United States. And this was a contract with the CDC. Well, we were about 60%, 70% into this contract when COVID-19 emerged out of Wuhan and started threatening the globe. And we were asked by the CDC and others who had to make the frontline decisions whether we could, we could pivot our models and rapidly do analyses to help us understand this emerging threat and what we could do about it. So since January of 2020, literally the day we heard about an anomalous virus emerging in Wuhan, we started working around the clock to use models to address three different goals, helping everybody to understand the threat, to forecast the threat and to contain the threat. And we were been doing this for three different audiences. For example, we've responded to requests from the White House Coronavirus Task Force. We've done a lot of work in our own backyard, helping to support decision-making in Austin by city authorities, by schools, by individuals. We've been trying to get work, word out to the public about what this virus is all about and what we can do as individuals to protect ourselves and our families and our neighborhoods. And we have been trying to disseminate our research as fast as possible to other scientists and learn from them in the, in the process. So what I'm gonna do today for the rest of my 10 minutes is take you on a whirlwind tour of some of the work we've done over the last year to address these three different goals, starting with the goal of just trying to understand the threat. So very early on, basically day one, we heard that there was this virus uh, spreading in Wuhan, but we didn't know how many people were infected. We didn't know how fast it was spreading. And we didn't know if it had already emerged in other cities around China or around the world. And we didn't really trust the data we were getting out of China. So how could we answer these questions? We looked to data that we could trust. What could we trust? Well, we trusted the first 19 reported cases outside of China, and that included some of the first cases in Bangkok, in Seattle, and Chicago, and the other cities you see on that map. We also had really extensive data about global air travel in and out of Wuhan, as well as rail and ground travel among 400 different cities in China. And we used that kind of data to triangulate, to figure out how fast was the virus spreading in Wuhan in order for it to have already appeared in those 19 cities where it first appeared. And what we found is that it was spreading very fast and it had already traveled quite far. By the time of the January 23rd lockdown of Wuhan, China had only reported 425 cases, and those are the black dots you see on the graph. And we estimated on January 22nd that there were already 12,400 cases of the virus in Wuhan. We also projected that it was probably already emerging in hundreds of cities in China uh, before they even knew there was a single case. And sure enough, in the days and weeks that followed, those cities found cases. The second study we did early on just to characterize the threat 
was the most alarming, the most jaw dropping study that we did during this entire pandemic. It was a very simple study. We worked with Chinese students to gather data that had been posted on 18 different websites for different public health agencies in China. And then we were looking for case reports that provided information that person A had been infected, they developed symptoms on a certain date, they then infected person B, and we know what date they developed symptoms. Using that kind of data, we could estimate what's called the serial interval. If I infect you, it's the amount of time between me first feeling sick and you first feeling sick. If we can know what that serial interval is, then we can get a good sense of what the pace of transmission will be. So we made these estimates early on where we, when we still really didn't understand how this, this virus was spreading. And we found three very alarming things. And what you see here is just a histogram, just a frequency distribution of those serial intervals for 450 early cases in China. The first thing we observed was that this virus was spreading fast. It was spreading about twice as fast as the original SARS virus from 2003. That was alarming because up till that point in time, we assumed that we would be able to use the same mitigation measures to stop this virus as we had used successfully against the original SARS virus. And this was, this was sort of a, a alarming idea that we, would, we were not gonna be able to race and win the race against this virus. We also noticed that sometimes it took a while for people to spread the virus, meaning that we would have to isolate cases for quite a long time to ensure no transmission. But by far the most alarming observation of all were these negative serial intervals. That means that the person, the infector, the person who did the infecting actually didn't develop symptoms until after the person they infected. So they were spreading pre-symptomatically. And we now know this very well, that this virus is stealthy. It spreads before people even have symptoms. And some people never develop symptoms at all. When we shared this information with the, our colleagues at the CDC, their response was, you must be wrong. And within days we were confirmed, this was confirmed with other data, and it was really the moment when we realized that this had the makings for a global pandemic that would be very hard to stop. The last example of modeling just to understand the threat is very recent. We've been trying to understand where the various variant viruses are spreading, including the B117 virus uh, out of the UK. This is a map showing our estimates for the likelihood that it was already in 19 different countries by early December of 2020, we estimate that there was at least a 50% chance that it was already spreading in the United States by October. And this graph is actually using data closer to home. This is an estimate for how much variant B117 we actually have in the UT, spreading in the UT community. We've already confirmed several cases and our models project that probably by the beginning of March, uh, the variant will be the dominant virus spreading in the UT community. So let me pivot now to modeling goal number two forecasting the threat. And forecasting pandemics and epidemics and in general outbreaks of any disease turns out to be a lot harder than forecasting the weather, which is already extremely difficult. And why is that? Well, we have to not only predict what the virus is going to do, but we also have to understand how the climate's gonna impact the virus. And importantly, we have to understand how people are gonna behave. And we know we do not have a crystal ball for the decisions our policymakers are gonna make or the decisions that we are gonna make on a daily basis that might lead to increased or decrease in transmission. The very first question we were asked, the very first forecasting request we received was from the White House Coronavirus Task Force. They asked us in March, uh, how many people are likely to die from the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States in 2020? And our answer was that we do not have a crystal ball. There is no way for us to project that without knowing what policies are going to be in place and how people are going to behave. So instead of giving a forecast, what we offered were three different scenario projections. These were if-then forecasts. If we do not do anything to control the virus, then we, at, we projected that there would be over a million deaths in 2020 alone. And that's that left, that's that left bar. If we completely lock down and we stay locked down indefinitely, or we find some other measure for really re repressing the spread of the virus, we could contain the deaths in 2020 under 50,000. But if we do something in between, which is essentially the roller coaster that we rode throughout 2020, then we anticipated there would be somewhere between 200,000 and 400,000 deaths. And indeed, sadly, the US reported 344,764 deaths just in 2020. Since then, we have been working very hard to build models that do allow us to make at least short-term forecasts, even with the difficulty of not being able to anticipate human behavior. 
And we maintain now multiple different forecasting dashboards on our website at the UT uh, COVID-19 Modeling Consortium. Here's a screenshot of our, our dashboard that projects COVID deaths at the scale of the whole United States, the 50 US states, and, and 100 large metropolitan areas. And one of the interesting things about the model that we use to project deaths is that we actually incorporate cell phone mobility data like that you see on the right side of your screen. We get data from a company called SafeGraph at the level of a census tract where we know how many hours per day are people staying at home, how often are they visiting places like restaurants, bars, grocery stores, parks, et cetera. And we use that to estimate how fast the virus is spreading in communities. We also have a dashboard that is doing forecasting for Austin. We have a bunch of key estimates at the top. They estimate, tell us how fast the virus is spreading, whether or not the pandemic is in a growth phase or a decline phase, and what the difference is between cases now and cases two weeks ago. We also make projections for what's gonna happen in our area hospitals for three or four weeks ahead. The other thing that we do on our Austin dashboard is we backcast. We look at what this virus has been doing over the last uh, year, almost now. And what we, what the graph I'm showing you here is a graph of something called the effective reproduction number. It essentially tells us how fast the virus is spreading. If this number is above one, that's that dash line there, it means that the pandemic is in a growth phase. If it's below one, it means it's declining. And as we look back, we see the story that we've all lived through. The virus was spreading very quickly before we actually saw it in the community. Then we closed schools. We went into our stay home work site, safe, order, and those had the desired effect of rapidly reducing the transmission rate of the virus. Then we started to open up in early May and mid-May, and that had the, the, the effect of leading to increased transmission of the virus and a summer surge. When our hospitals were filling up, the, the state gave local authorities the, uh, the, the ability to lot, uh, enact measures to slow transmission locally. Then the state closed bars, enacted a face mask order, UT opened in the fall, in the early fall, and the transmission rates started climbing through the fall in the community. As kids went back to school, people went back to work, we started being more relaxed. Uh, after Thanksgiving, you can see a little bump. After Christmas, you can see a little bump. And then right before Christmas, because of the filling hospitals, we went into a stage five order, and that had the desired effect of once again reducing the transmission rate in our community. So that's a little slice of the forecasting and backcasting we've been doing. And a lot of that is public facing through our dashboards. And the last, sub, last thing I'm just gonna hit on is the modeling we've been doing to help figure out how to contain the threat. And this is where we spend probably most of our time in trying to support decision makers and figuring out how to navigate the threats, the challenges that are changing day by day and week by week. A lot of the work we've done is with the city of Austin and in Late April and early May, as we were looking towards the reopening of, of our economy, of our society, people going back to work, the end of the stay home orders, we were worried about this scenario, that people would go back to life, the virus would start spreading, and we would have an overwhelming number of hospitalizations that, uh, that compromise the integrity of our healthcare system. So that's what this projection is. It's a scenario where we, the, we don't do much to slow spread and we have many, many deaths in Austin and, and hospitals that cannot provide adequate care. So we worked with the city to design a strategy that would help to prevent this. So how do we make a playbook? Well, we first had to figure out what were the goals of the policy we were gonna design. And we came up with two goals. One is that we wanted to always keep hospitalizations under capacity so that we could provide safe and effective care to anyone who needed it, whether it was for COVID or for anything else. And we wanted to avoid an, a future stay home order if at all possible, or if we had to go into one to act, absolutely minimize the time we had to be under restrictive costly measures. And we did a lot of modeling using the supercomputers at the Texas Advanced Computer Center. And we came up with two solutions. One is that we should be tracking the daily number of COVID-19 hospital admissions to get a reliable indicator of how fast the virus is spreading in our community and how fast our hospitals are filling. And then we should tap on the brakes at key thresholds. And we actually de de design, derived the thresholds that now are being used by the city and have been used since May of 2020. This is the city's key indicators dashboard. And if you ever wonder why, if, you, if you're in Austin and you, and you follow this thing, if you under, ever wondered how do we come up with the numbers that divide stage five in red from stage four in orange from stage three in yellow, well, that came from our models. 
And, and the city has been following, tracking the admissions, that's the data you see here. And as we change colors, we go into more restrictive or less restrictive measures. So how is this working so far? Well, it seems to be working pretty well as planned. Um, when we started, when this, these are our ICU patients for COVID, when the cases really started climbing in late December, we went into the stage five order, which was really restrictive. Uh, we also uh, um, had restrictions on elective surgeries and, um, and it seemed to work as, as intended. We uh, almost reached our ICU capacity for COVID patients of 200 patients, but we, we triggered that stage five just in time to curb the pandemic before we surpassed that threshold. And now fortunately the numbers are continuing to decline. We're do we've been doing a lot of other modeling to help policymakers navigate the months ahead including modeling to help figure out how we use vaccines. Uh, and this is modeling that Dr. McClellan has collaborated with us on. So, and this is modeling that was requested by the CDC to help support them in deciding how to prioritize and roll out vaccines. This is an example of some projections from our models. So this black line was a projection of what we do if we don't, what might happen if we don't vaccinate anybody. Uh, and then these are two different scenarios, one where we start vaccinating people in January and one where we start rolling things out in February. And you can see the benefits of accelerating the rollout. And in fact, we found when we did a lot of analyses of different priorities, who do we prioritize first, older people, younger people, which risk groups, which working groups, we found that priorities are important, but what's way more important is just getting vaccines to people, whoever you can get it to as fast as possible. And this actually goes back to a question that was asked to Dr. McClellan at the um, about 15 minutes ago. Uh, should we be um, should we be giving one shot or two shots? And the answer is there's there is a lot of uncertainty about the efficacy of giving it uh, just one shot instead of two. But if they are sort of uh, in, have an intermediate level of efficacy, what we find is on a population level, maybe not on an individual level, but on a population level, we can save a lot more lives and accelerate the end of the pandemic by giving out one dose, the first dose before we give out second doses. In, in terms of navigating the months ahead, we're gonna continue tracking the variants. We're supporting the CDC and helping them figure out how to ramp up molecular surveillance. So we're, we're sequencing more, so we know when and where the, the variants are emerging and spreading. We are continuing to support schools and school districts and safely bringing kids and teachers back to campus. This is a dashboard we have to help schools understand uh, the current risks in their, in their neighborhoods, in their counties. Um, and we're doing analysis of how we can more effectively use testing to safeguard uh, campuses, college campuses, schools, uh, workplaces, long-term care facilities, uh, so that we can get, get back to life as we want it while still preventing the transmission of the virus. How can you help? You could get yourself vaccinated when it's your turn. You can get tested if there is surveillance tested offered in your community, at your workplace, in your, in your campus. Uh, you can make daily decisions to stay safe and you can encourage the others to do the same. And you can continue to do science, to learn science, to use your mind to help make a difference. Science is not, can not only have an impact, but it can be a lot of fun. Uh, the, the folks who did this work were dozens of people from lots of different disciplines who have been contributing to the Texas, the UT uh, COVID-19 modeling consortium since last March. Um, this work is supported by the Centers for Disease Control, National Institutes of Health, other agencies. We're close partnership with the Texas Advanced Computing Center, a generous gift from Tito's Handmade Vodka. And again, it's been the work of just dozens of people who have brought their, their, their heart, their minds, their time to helping save lives and understanding this threat. So thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Lauren, uh, for your presentation and also for working as hard as humanly possible uh, over the past uh, year and more to, uh, to um, keep us safe. Thank you very much indeed. We have time for a few questions. Uh, so let's go ahead with those. Uh, the first one is from Ying and Ying asks, what can be done to improve the response to the next pandemic by different actors, government, healthcare sector, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that this pandemic has made us realize is sort of a collective failure of imagination, right? I mean, I've been modeling pandemics for 20 years. I've been modeling for state agencies, uh, for federal agencies. And I will tell you all of our models up until 2019 pretty much assumed that the next pandemic 
was going to be an influenza pandemic. So a lot of our planning had been around uh, making sure we had medical countermeasures for influenza. We had playbooks and game plans for influenza. Uh, the assumption would be that there would be a six month timeline for vaccines and we, we would use non-pharmaceutical um, measures in that, in that interim time period. And so COVID-19 really took us by surprise. And so I think at all levels, we need to sort of overcome this failure of imagination and understand not only that there are a lot of potential pathogen threats that we've never conceived of, never experienced anything like them that may lay in store for us, but also that a pathogen threat is not just about a virus or an, another microbe that spreads to the population. It's also about the many complex interdependencies between our health and our, and our general life on earth our socioeconomic systems, our infrastructure, our educational systems. So really we need to be thinking in a much more holistic, um, much broader sense as, as we look to making sure that we are much more resilient in the face of future threats. Thank you. Shamitria asks, what is herd immunity and how will we know when we've achieved it? That is the, the million dollar question, the billion dollar question, right? It's, it's being asked, it's been talked about in the news, it's talked about by scientists. And unfortunately, it's not a very hard and fast concept, but I'll tell you what it is. And then I'll tell you why it's a little bit loose and hard to define for, for COVID-19. So in a very simple system, in a very simple world where we have a pathogen spreading and after somebody gets infected or after they get vaccinated, they're 100% protected from future, uh, a, a subsequent infection. Herd immunity is basically the number of people that either have to be vaccinated or infected, that get immunized one way or another, uh, uh, the threshold number of people after which there are not enough susceptible people around and the virus will just dissipate on its own. We won't have to do anything else. It'll go away and it won't be able to invade again. So the herd immunity threshold in, in that perfect world is that number of people that have to be immunized. The issue with COVID is that, you know, there's evidence that people are not perfectly immunized um, after infection with the virus. There's a lot of uncertainty whether these new variants will overcome or evade immunity acquired through either natural infection or immunization. And so we may be in a world where uh, we never really can fully achieve herd immunity because the virus, it continually finds a way to find susceptible people. So, um, and the other complexity with herd immunity is herd immunity also depends on the social milieu in which the virus is spreading. If we are all wearing face masks all the time and taking precautions, then the virus doesn't spread as fast and fewer people have to be immunized in order to get to the point where the virus starts to dissipate on its own. If we are not taking those kinds of precautions and the virus is sort of able to spread much more quickly, then the herd immunity threshold will be much higher and a lot more people will have to be immunized in order for us, in order for the virus to start uh, waning on its own. So, but what will we see? Well, at some point we may see that the virus has peaked and it's going away and as we relax measures, it doesn't start to go back again, up again, right? We've been on this roller coaster where we think it's going away and then it goes back up. And it's often because we're changing our policies or behavior. But if we get to a point where we've peaked and we see that we see that as we relax things, we're still in good shape, then we can feel a little bit of confidence that even if we haven't achieved full herd immunity, we've gotten to a point where there's just a lot fewer susceptibles around to, to fuel the spread of the virus. Thanks. I've been wanting to ask that myself. So th uh, thank you very much, uh, Shamitria. Uh, we'll take one more and then we'll wrap things up. So this is from DevDat who asks, do you have models that are specific to certain strategies? For example, the efficacy of masks or other measures? Yes. So we have, we have Uber models, which try to layer in all the different interventions. And in fact, the CDC project we were working on 2009 before COVID-19 emerged was specifically to build models that allow us to, to incorporate multiple different strategies. So vaccinating some part of the population while giving antivirals to another part while closing some schools. And really as a way to think about optimizing not just a single strategy, but a collection of strategies. And I'll just mention that that project that the CDC has now kind of expanded into a five-year project was, was funding not only my lab, but funding four other labs around the world to build these kinds of models with the idea that 
no one, la one, no one model is perfect. No one has a crystal ball. We have different data, we have different expertise. And so really the way we get a robust understanding for how viruses spread and how we can most effectively stop them is by taking many different models and looking at all of their results and ensembling them that's, that means basically averaging them or looking at them side by side to figure out which strategies are likely to save the most lives in the long run. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. And as I said before, thank you for everything uh, you have been doing and will do. Uh, I'm afraid I have to wrap things up today, even though I know there are many more questions that people would like to ask. I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us for this kickoff session of the Texas Science Festival. Uh, my special thanks, of course, to our presenters, Jason and Lauren, for sharing their time, their knowledge, their expertise, while balancing as many Texans are right now an awful lot. Uh, the schedule, the schedule for the festival is regularly updated, so please be sure to drop by sciencefest.utexas.edu and sign up for additional sessions between now and March the 26th. If you have questions after today's session, you may contact cnsdev, that's C-N-S-D-E-V, cnsdev at austin.utexas.edu. Thank you for your interest in Texas science. We hope to see you virtually at more sessions. Bye-bye.